Magic about hair and nails. Not all the sacred books of Zoroastrianism have been preserved, and only a small part of the surviving sections can be ascribed to the Magus himself, namely the 17 Psalms or Gathas. The laws of worship and sacrifice are of early date. Other books of the Magian cult are the hymns, the daily prayers, and the liturgies. The books called Vendidad, compilations of anti-demoniac lore, were written in the middle of the 5th century BC. They contain rituals which are of a more purely magical type than some others, and which therefore attract our special attention. The dogmatic theology of Zoroastrianism is essentially religious, but the ritual of dealing with demons is magical. Two instances will illustrate the magical aspect of cleansing rites, the ritual applying to hair and nails, described in this section, and that applying to the fly demon, treated in the next. In the 17th chapter of the Vendidad, there is a prescription devoted to parings of nails and clippings of hair, which as soon as they are separated from the body belong to the evil one as abodes of uncleanliness. Hair and nails taken from the dead are mentioned in the fable of how Zoroaster converted the royal family to the new doctrine, and how he escaped his plot against his life. According to the story, courtiers hid bones in his room, together with hair and nails robbed from the dead. Zoroaster, accused of wizardry, was condemned to be hung. At this moment the king's horse fell sick. Its legs had entered its body. Free me, said the prophet, and I will restore one leg. Freedom was granted, and the leg came forth. Lord, said Zoroaster, if thou wilt embrace my creed, I will restore the second leg. After the king's conversion, the two remaining legs were also restored, but only after the rest of the royal family and the court had become Zoroastrians. Hair and nails, which were used by wizards for conjuring up the deceased, live a life apart from that of the body. They lack sensibility and are seemingly dead. Yet they grow, and grow much more rapidly than the rest of the body. This individual tempo of growth, together with a complete lack of sensibility, may have led them to be regarded as individuals, growing upon people like parasitic plants. In such a belief, their independence would be sufficient cause for disquiet. 1. Zarathustra, Zoroaster, asked Ahura Mazda, or Mazd, O Ahura Mazda, most beneficent spirit, maker of the material world, thou holy one, which is the most deadly deed whereby a man increases the most baleful strength of the devas, as he would do by offering them sacrifice? 2. Ahura Mazda answered, It is when a man here below, combining his hair or shaving it off or paring his nails, drops them into a hole or into a crack. 3. Then for want of the lawful rites being observed, devas are produced on the earth which we call lice, and which eat up the corn in the cornfield and the clothes in the wardrobe. 4. Therefore, O Zarathustra, whenever here below thou shalt comb thy hair or shave it off, or pare thy nails, thou shalt take them away ten paces from the faithful, twenty paces from the fire, thirty paces from the water, fifty paces from the consecrated bundles of barisma, holy twigs. 5. Then thou shalt dig a hole, ten fingers deep if the earth is hard, twelve fingers deep if it is soft. Thou shalt take thy hair down there, and thou shalt say aloud these fiend-smiting words. Out of his pity, Mazda, made plants grow. 6. Thereupon thou shalt draw three furrows with a knife of metal around the hole, or six, or nine, and thou shalt chant the Ahuna Varia three times, or six, or nine. 7. For the nails, thou shalt dig a hole, out of the house, as deep as the top joint of the little finger. Thou shalt take the nails down there, and thou shalt say aloud these fiend-smiting words. The words are heard from the pious in holiness and good thought. Zoroaster's concern with hair and nails has given full scope to the ironical humor of many who regard this as superstition unworthy of the wise. It is true that similar rites exist among primitive tribes whose level of civilization is far below that of the ancient Iranians. Cut hair and nails are hidden away by many primitive people, 
or deposited in sacred places and burned, to prevent their falling into the hands of sorcerers who would use them for evil spells against their former owners. According to Fraser, the belief is widespread among these tribes that men may be bewitched through the clippings of their hair and the parings of their nails. Among primitives, the custom existed and still exists of releasing war prisoners after their hair is shorn. The hair is kept as hostage, a warrant for the future behavior of the defeated. Thus they can be punished easily from any distance. Whatever punishment the victors inflict upon the hair, its owners too will suffer. Our skepticism about Zoroastrian superstitions may subside when we learn how many similar beliefs still exist in Europe and America. Chilean gauchos stuff their hair into walls, as do the Turks. Armenians hide it in churches, hollow trees, and columns. French peasants of the Vosges Mountains bury their hair secretly, together with extracted teeth, and mark the spot so that they may find them on the day of resurrection. In the village of Drumconrath, in Ireland, some trustworthy people, having learned from scripture that their hairs were all numbered by the Almighty, expect to have to account for them on the day of judgment. The good people of Liège in Belgium remove their hair carefully from their combs, lest it should come into the possession of some witch. Zoroaster's belief that hair and nails produce insects or other animals did not spring from his own imagination. The belief was older than Iran, and it was still alive in the 16th century of the Christian era. Women's hair buried in dung was thought to produce snakes. In his book on witchcraft, published in 1603, the famous French judge, Henri Bourguet, recalls St. Thomas's opinion that rotten sticks can turn into snakes. Though Paracelsus had declared, Nihil est sine spermate, nothing exists without semen, the old belief lived on into the epoch of Leibniz and Newton. Today, spontaneous generation of insects is held possible by people in Brittany. Hair carried away by wind, they think, will produce flies. Snakes, bugs, frogs, lice, flies were considered imperfect animals which are reproduced by corruption and not by semen. This implies that these animals were in relation with the infernal powers. According to Zoroaster, they were created by Ahriman, since nothing imperfect could derive from Ormazd. Imperfection was, in Christianity, ascribed to the devil. Popular tradition warns that he can never appear in perfect human form. Either he limps or has a horse's hoof, betraying his true nature. Satan was, like Ahriman, the master of imperfect animals. Did he not give a silver louse to his devotees as a token of his friendship? Great mystery surrounds the belief that hair and nails are specially susceptible to corruption, for in fact the contrary is true. In the grave they continue to live for some time independently of the decaying corpse. Christianity, like Zoroastrianism, correlated hair and hell. Pious Jews think similarly about nails, a belief which causes them to pair them as short as possible. They profess that nails are abodes of evil, and that they are the only part of the body incapable of serving God. Analogous beliefs do exist in Madagascar, where natives think that the devil dwells under unpaired fingernails. Witches, says Paracelsus, give their hair to Satan as a deposit on the contract they make with him. But the evil one does not waste this hair, for he cuts it up small and mixes it with the exaltation from which he forms hail. Thus it has come to pass that we ordinarily find little hairs in hail. The conviction that hair is a refuge par excellence for devilish spells was shared by the persecutors of witches. Before going to the torture chamber, suspected witches had all their hair shorn, a practice which made many a witch confess before the torture was applied. The French legal authority Jean Baudin records such an instance. In 1485, 40 witches in northern Italy simultaneously confessed their crimes, after having undergone this procedure. In defense of the custom, he reminds us that Apollonius of Tyana was treated in the same way when the emperor Domitian had him arrested for wizardry. 
The shocking happenings in liberated France, where women who had dealings with the Germans saw their locks fall under the scissors of patriots, may likewise be traced to primitive magic. It is a cleansing rite performed upon a taboo person. Their hair was infected with the virus of the taboo which France had placed upon the